Uh, morning comrades, um, those of you who know me might be wondering why I'm so dourly dressed today. Well, the thing is, I've been reading a lot about the Queen and she's been in the news quite a lot in, uh, in the past two weeks and the poor woman is, is really quite unwell. She's had to take two weeks uh, off work and I've really been hoping that she will die in time <laughs> for my talk. So just in case, there's still time, you know, I've got about another 40 minutes, uh, I'll keep an eye on my phone until I did to dress all back today you know just as a mark of respect in case our uh, our dear monarch should pass um so fingers crossed everyone i did check just now and apparently boris johnson spoke to her yesterday and she's doing well she's working at home from her desk now when your job entirely consists of shaking people's hands i'm not sure how you can do that from a, a, a desk but i'm um, you know she's a hard-working lady um i'm sure she will find a way um but anyone who's grown up uh, in this country will be familiar uh, with, with the story that we're told uh, about the monarchy. It's a very uh, familiar fairy tale. Um, you know, the story goes that the monarchy is nothing more uh, than a ceremonial role in, in modern society. That the Queen is just a, a powerless figurehead, a lovely figurehead, but one without uh, any power, who represents kind of thousands of years of, of wonderful British uh, tradition uh, and exists to unite uh, the nation. So, you know, things like the Queen's Speech, state opening of Parliament, all of that, we're told, is just harmless pompery. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of a shiny ornament atop the wonderful Christmas tree that is uh, British democracy uh, and the British state. It's just there to look nice, uh, but it doesn't actually affect uh, how the country is run. After all, we're a democracy and uh, you know, the people make uh, the decisions. And of course, the Queen is a very lovely lady who works um, very hard. Uh, and this is the same story that the royal family themselves put forward. So if you were to look on the Queen's website, yes, she has a website, uh, I have looked at it. Uh, it gives the following explanation of, of the role of the monarchy. It says, the monarchy is the oldest form of government in the United Kingdom. In a monarchy, a king or queen is head of state. The British monarchy is known as a constitutional monarchy. This means that while the sovereign is head of state, the ability to make and pass legislation resides within elected parliament. Although the sovereign no longer has a political or executive role, he or she continues to play an important part in the life of the nation. As a head of state, the monarch undertakes constitutional and representational duties which have developed over 1,000 years of history. In addition to these state duties, the monarch has a less formal role as a head of the nation. The sovereign acts as a focus for national identity, unity and pride. It gives a sense of stability and continuity and officially recognises success and excellence. And it supports the idea of voluntary service. So I think we can agree, you know, the Queen is doing a really excellent job. Britain is a wonderfully stable country under her leadership. You know, no one's been queuing uh, for petrol. There hasn't been running out of food uh, in the shops. And I feel a really strong sense of pride that a gang of Nazi sympathizing racist pedophiles stand at the head of this country. Um, of course, I'm joking, but I think we can see from these, you know, recent scandals that Georgina referred to, all the way back, really, actually, to the, to the death of Princess Diana, uh, to the recent revelations of, of Meghan Markle, and the abuse allegations levelled against Prince Andrew, uh, we've been afforded a kind of a, a glimpse of the rotten stench that lies at the heart of this institution. And I think the sinister truth uh, uh, about the monarchy can't be further uh, from, from the myth and the lies that are peddled um, by the ruling class. So in this talk, I will try to explain why uh, the monarchy is actually an important reserve of, of power for the bourgeoisie. It's a tool that has been purposely maintained as a counter-revolutionary weapon that will undoubtedly uh, be deployed uh, by the ruling class in their, in their fight against the working class and their fight uh, against socialism. So it's elementary really that, that any consistent Democrat, let alone a revolutionary socialist uh, such as ourselves, should stand firmly for the immediate abolition uh, of this rotten relic. But I think in order to understand the role of the monarchy, we actually have to look uh, back um, at its history and chase its development as a modern uh, institution. 
So there have been kings or queens uh, in this country uh, that we, we take all Britain uh, in one form or another since even before the Roman uh, uh, conquest in 55 BC when uh, Julius Caesar um, defeated uh, King Cantalveni. Um, but despite the propaganda uh, that the monarchy uh, puts forward, um, that's over a thousand years old, etc., the, the institution that we know today really dates from 1688 and, uh, and what's called uh, the Glorious Revolution. Uh, this happened when James II, uh, the last Stuart King, was unceremoniously uh, uh, kicked out and replaced by the Dutch adventurer William of Orange. Um, but as we'll come to learn, this, uh, this sordid palace coup was neither glorious nor was it uh, a revolution. In fact, 46 years earlier, there'd been a genuine revolution uh, in England uh, in what historians prefer to refer to as uh, the English Civil War. Um, the young English bourgeoisie had come into conflict with the absolutist monarchy of uh, Charles I, which was standing in the way of the further development of, of capitalism. It had become a fetter on the growth and profits of the young uh, English capitalist class, um, and as such came into a conflict with the, with the majority in Parliament representing the English bourgeoisie uh, and the City of London. And so they mobilised an army uh, to fight against the King. Um, Events got out of hand. It stirred up the masses, as all revolutions do. Uh, the independents and, and then the levellers and the digger, diggers represented the democratic and socialist aspirations of the masses. And this inspired the ranks of uh, the New Model Army, which was organised uh, by, by Cromwell along modern lines, which made it a highly effective fighting unit and secured the inevitable victory of the parliamentarian forces uh, against the king, which culminated in the trial uh, and then uh, execution uh, by beheading of uh, Charles I uh, for treason. But after the beheading of this uh, hated tyrant, uh, how come we ended up back with a, with a monarchy uh, today, back with a king uh, on the throne? Um, it's very similar to a process we see in lots of revolutions. Um, you know, in, in, in the French Revolution, uh, uh, they got rid of their monarchy. In, in fact, the monarchy was um, uh, reinstalled in France too for, for a period. But also, uh, you know, they ended up with... with, with um, Napoleon and the restoration of lots of uh, aspects of, of feudalism. Uh, and what happens in these bourgeois revolutions is the bourgeois carry out a revolution. They use the masses uh, to carry out that revolution. Um, uh, and when their power is secure, they turn against them. You know, just as Cromwell uh, went on to liquidate uh, uh, the levellers after uh, the revolution. And fearing the revolution has, has gone too far, that it's whipped up the masses uh, too much, they support a political counter-revolution while maintaining the new capitalist relations that have been established uh, uh, by the revolution and the overthrow of uh, feudalism. And so after Cromwell's death, the, the fearful English bourgeoisie uh, did a deal with the landed aristocracy, agreeing to the return of the monarchy, and they installed uh, Charles II, Charles I's son, uh, uh, at its head. Um, but they invited him to become king on the, on the condition that there would be no return to absolutism. In other words, they wanted to maintain the political and economic gains that the bourgeoisie had secured through the revolution and continue to th rule through parliament uh, with the king as a simple figurehead. But Charles II had uh, very different ideas um, and immediately began concentrating power into his hands, going so far as to attack uh, the bourgeois strongholds in the city of London and other town corporations by revoking their royal charters uh, and purging their governing body of, of Whigs, which was the, the, the forerunner of uh, the Liberal Party and would... Um, uh, uh, the main political representative of, of the English bourgeoisie at the time uh, and packing them with royalist uh, Tories. And even for the last four years of his reign, uh, Charles II ruled without Parliament, having dismissed it in 1681. His heir, James II, continued this campaign of concentrating power in the monarchy's hands. And this culminated in a, in a judicial ruling um, uh, around him being able to appoint uh, uh, Catholics to position of power. Um, 
that the basically transformed Parliament into a mere sleeping partner uh, in the Constitution. In effect, the ruling said that the Parliament could pass whatever laws it liked, but it was up to the King uh, whether they were enforced. And this was basically the final straw uh, for the bourgeoisie. Everything that they had gained uh, uh, through the revolution, through the war against Charles I, uh, was under threat. And it actually united the Tories and the Whigs in resistance uh, to, to the Crown. They issued an invitation uh, to William of Orange, um, who was a Dutch guy who'd married one of uh, James's uh, daughters. I think he was technically sixth in line uh, to the throne. And they said, please come over and invade Britain uh, and get rid of uh, this tyrant, uh, which, he, which he duly did and was rewarded as becoming uh, King of England. But this was basically a, a grubby palace coup, but we like to call it, you know, in history, the, the, the glorious uh, revolution. But having handed William the crown, uh, the Whigs and Tories remained united in an effort to, to limit the power of uh, the monarchy or any future monarchy could hold. And this resulted in a so-called uh, Declaration of Rights. Um, but the rights in question weren't the rights of ordinary people uh, against the state or ordinary people against the monarchy. They were the rights of the bourgeoisie against the crown. They were the rights of the bourgeoisie against the feudal aristocracy. And this is the foundation of the, the, the constitutional monarchy uh, that we have today. And there's a very popular uh, myth that, you know, throughout history, the monarchy has always been uh, uh, very popular. That, you know, that actually the, the, the king was brought back because we couldn't cope without a king. Uh, uh, and Cromwell was such an evil man. So we had to bring the monarchy back because, you know, British peasants just didn't know what to do without uh, a king sitting on a throne. But actually, um, at, at this time, the monarchy was extremely uh, unpopular. And the next 150 years were full of kind of scandals and, and upheavals. And it was only actually towards the end of, of Queen Victoria's uh, reign and the beginning of the 20th century that the ruling class took steps to rebuild the, the monarchy as the institution uh, we know it today. Um, so they lavished huge sums of money on, on spectacles such as Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887. And a lot of the present day uh, kind of like ceremonial pantomimes like the changing of the guard, uh, you know, the, the, the royal opening state opening of parliament, you know, all that stuff with the, the shaking of the mace, etc. Uh, you know, we think of these as ancient British tradi traditions. Lots of these were actually invented during the reign of, of Queen Victoria as an attempt to kind of build up uh, the monarchy and the consciousness of the masses. And this isn't a coincidence. It actually flowed from the political needs of the bourgeoisie uh, at the time. Because during this period, uh, you know, after pressure from below, after pressure from the ruling class, there was a gradual opening up of the electoral franchise uh, uh, in Britain. The total registered electorate in, in the United Kingdom grew from 5.7 million people in 1885 to 21 million in 1918. Uh, but if the ruling class were going to allow the great unwashed, the masses, uh, a say in how the country was run, they needed a guarantee uh, against things getting out of hand against them having too much of a say uh, and turning against uh, the bourgeoisie. So then once again, they turned back uh, uh, to the monarchy. Is that a guarantee? Um, and the reasons for this are very clearly set out in a, in a marvelous book by uh, Walter Beghot, which he wrote in 1865 called The English Constitution. Uh, and it's really, a, it's very much an astounding read because he clearly, um, uh, you know, he was writing for people of his own class and it probably didn't even enter into his head that it was possible for, for a working person to ever read his book. Uh, and therefore he was remarkably frank and honest. You know, it was basically a manual for the bourgeoisie about how the British state uh, was run and how it functioned. And so important is Bacot's book that uh, actually generations of, of British monarchs uh, have been instructed to read it as part of their education uh, on how they rule. So I've never watched it. Uh, but if you do, season one of The Crown apparently has a scene in which uh, the young uh, uh, Elizabeth is, is, is read aloud uh, from Bacot's book by um, her, her tutor. Um, 
So according to Bacot, England has two uh, sets of institutions. There's what he refers to as the dignified institutions, which are there to impress the many, and then the efficient ones that are there to govern uh, the many. And the main dignified institution is uh, the monarchy. And he, he, he explained that it played an essential role in winning and sustaining the loyalty uh, and, and the confidence of the masses of ordinary people, helping the state to gain authority uh, and legitimacy. His message was very clear, you know, uh, the masses don't understand politics, they can't be really trusted uh, to vote the right way, uh, but since they conquered the right to vote, the ruling class uh, had to devise a royal pantomime uh, to distract them, while the, uh, the real exercise of power is kept firmly in the hands of the bourgeoisie. So he writes, uh, it should be evident that the monarch does no wrong. He should not be brought too closely to real measurement. He should be aloof and solitary. As the functions of the English royalty are for the most part latent, it fulfills this condition. It seems to order, but it never seems to struggle. It is commonly hidden like a mystery and sometimes paraded like a pageant, but neither case is contentious. The nation is divided into parties. Um, we would say the nation is divided into classes, uh, but he means the same thing. But the crown is of no party. Its apparent separation from business is that which re removes it both from enmities and from desecration, which preserves its mystery, which enables it to combine the affection of conflicting parties to be a visible symbol of unity to all of those so imperfectly educated uh, as to need uh, a symbol. So as he notes, the powers of the monarchy uh, are latent. And that means in, in normal times, uh, in normal times of constitutional rule, the monarchy seems to have uh, no real power and purposefully maintains uh, a visage of, of innocuousness, innocuousness uh, and mere cer ceremony. Uh, but should the establishment require it in times of crisis, uh, the monarchy can legally assume uh, almost unlimited uh, powers. Um, so it's more than a feudal anachronism. It's more than just a, 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 a pantomime uh, for the people uh, of Britain. It's actually a reserve weapon in the hands of the ruling class. Because behind the curtain, behind all these stories that we're told, we should never forget that it's Her Majesty's government. It's Her Majesty's loyal opposition. It's Her Majesty's civil service. It's Her Majesty's armed forces. It's Her Majesty's inspectorate of constabulary, to which all the police forces in the country uh, are accountable. The election of a government itself uh, in Britain is dependent on the monarch to call on Her Majesty's Prime Minister to form a government. And any legislation that is passed uh, in this country requires the Queen's approval through the royal assent process before it can come law. In essence, the monarchy is actually constitutionally the source of all power uh, in the British government. And these powers aren't just theoretical, um, as we're told. The Queen has exercised them many times herself uh, throughout her reign. For example, there's the, the little known process called uh, Queen's Consent, which was revealed uh, last year. And it's a convention whereby ministers and parliament allow the monarch to exercise uh, consultative and veto powers over laws affecting the monarchy's interests. So previously secret documents have disclosed that the Queen uh, has vetted more than a thousand parliamentary bills during her reign and in fact used the procedure to secretly lobby uh, for some laws to be altered to benefit her private uh, interests. So for example, she used the procedure to instruct government ministers to change a 1970s uh, transparency law in order to conceal her private wealth uh, from the public. Um, the same procedure actually applies to, to, um, uh, to Prince Charles, and he's used that uh, uh, procedure hundreds of times uh, uh, throughout the last few decades uh, to protect his interests, the interests of the Duchy of Cornwall, for example, um, uh, amending laws to prevent um, tenants on his land from being able to buy uh, uh, their property, for example. And this, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So for example, when, when the Queen prorogued Parliament in 2019, she actually revealed that uh, she, as an unelected head of state, has the power 
uh, to side with a minority in Parliament uh, and bypass the, sc the scrutiny of Britain's elected representatives against the wishes of the parliamentary uh, 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 majority. You know, if you cast your mind back uh, to that time, it feels like a long time ago, lots has happened uh, since. Uh, you know, Boris Johnson couldn't get his uh, Brexit deal through Parliament. There was a deadlock. The, the, the majority of, 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 of MPs um, uh, were against the government. And so to solve this, uh, he merely asked the Queen uh, to, to suspend Parliament, to side with a minority in our democratically elected institutions against the wishes of a majority. And she was perfectly capable and constitutionally able um, to do so. And at the time, it was reported that the Queen was furious uh, about this because really it revealed uh, uh, her, her true power uh, and there was a fear on behalf of the monarchy that it could undermine her support and drag her into politics, uh, particularly the politics of Brexit, when of course she is, is meant to remain and appear uh, to be aloof and in, independent uh, of politics. Um, and that's because these powers are meant to remain hidden. They're meant to remain uh, uh, secret. They're, they're meant to be held back and used as a last resort uh, by uh, uh, the bourgeoisie against democratically elected governments that threaten uh, their interests, that threaten their profits. Um, that's why the Queen's powers include being able to dismiss, dismiss elected governments from office. Uh, and this is no theoretical power. Uh, it was, uh, this very power was used in a, in a constitutional crisis in Australia to remove the elected Labour government of Gow Whitlam in 1975. Now, Whitlam and the Labour Party had, had won an election uh, in 1972, a landslide election, after 23 years of uh, Liberal Party rule, the Liberals being um, the Australian equivalent of the Tories, the party of, of the bourgeoisie, the party of the ruling class, uh, on the basis of promising substantial reforms. And unlike most left reformists uh, in, in history, uh, Whitlam actually started to deliver uh, parts of his program under pressure from the Australian uh, uh, working class. Uh, his government introduced free higher education, they increased uh, health spending, they withdrew Australian troops uh, from Vietnam, uh, and they introduced equal pay rights uh, uh, for women and granted the first Aboriginal land rights in the history of Australia. Uh, but Soon after, the 1973 uh, uh, oil crisis signalled the end of the, the post-World War boom, and it plunged economies the world over uh, into recession. The Australian bourgeoisie, like uh, uh, the ruling class around the world, wanted to make the workers pay uh, for the crisis, and they demanded the overturn of Whitlam's re reforms, uh, as well as huge public spending cuts. Uh, it sounds like a familiar story, doesn't it? It sounds like the, the story of, uh, of the past 10 years of uh, Tory rule. Um, but it wasn't so much the Labour government that the ruling class uh, in Australia feared, but the organised workers that lay behind them. So in 1974, in response to the, the, the crisis, a huge strike wave had, had, had erupted uh, across Australia with uh, uh, workers uh, walking out to protect uh, their jobs and interests, to put pressure on the government uh, to maintain their reforms. And this is what really terrified uh, the, the Australian ruling class, you know, the, the, the organised workers exercising uh, um, their power. Uh, and this strike wave was threatening, uh, you know, to grow even further. So the bosses wanted the removal of, of Whitlam and they wanted a strong uh, government they could rely on to crush the workers' movement. Uh, so in stepped the Queen. Liberals manufactured a constitutional crisis in the Senate by blocking uh, the Labour government's budget uh, and the Queen's representative, Governor-General Sir John Kerr, uh, stepped in to remove Whitlam uh, and commissioned the leader of the opposition, uh, Malcolm Fraser, of the Liberal Party to act as a caretaker Prime Minister. Um, so this is a piece of history that's not really, uh, uh, you know, discussed. It's not really uh, uh, taught anywhere. Um, and in no uncertain terms, this was a coup. It was a coup carried out 
by the Queen uh, at the behest of the Australian bourgeoisie against a democratically elected government. And it was a perfectly legal coup. It was a perfectly constitutional uh, 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 coup, where a government that had been elected by the vast majority of Australians uh, to represent their interests was removed at the Queen because the representation of the interests of the working class threatened the interests of, uh, of the bourgeoisie. And that's no small uh, thing. And I think we should learn uh, um, uh, from this incident. Now, you might say uh, that that was uh, Australia. But of course, we have a very similar uh, system of government. We have the same uh, constitutional arrangements. And, and the Queen plays exactly the same role uh, in the British state. She does, in fact, play in the Canadian uh, and Australian um, uh, state. Uh, it demonstrates clearly and unequivocally that the Queen's powers aren't just theoretical and that the bourgeoisie are fully prepared to deploy them should their interests be sufficiently threatened. Um, the Queen not only has the power to, uh, to dismiss and appoint governments, constitutionally she also has the power to suspend Parliament and, and rule through what's called the Privy Council. It's an organ of state that's not often referred to because you know, they prefer it to remain uh, in, the, in the shadows um, until a national emergency requires uh, the, the green light to show its real face. So according to, to A. H. Hansen and, uh, and Malcolm Walls, um, experts in the, in the British uh, constitution, they wrote in their book Governing Britain, there are even some who still think of the monarch as the ultimate guardian of the constitution, equipped with powers which, although normally dormant, might be revived in circumstances of a serious constitutional crisis or incipient uh, revolution. So there you have it, from the mouths of the bourgeoisie themselves, the, the Queen's powers are usually dormant, but we keep them there just in case there's a revolution because she might come in useful. Um, so over many hundreds of years, uh, the bourgeoisie have come to realize that democracy was their preferred form uh, of government under capitalism. And that's not because they have any faith or belief uh, in democracy. In fact, they're very contemptuous of democracy. But it's because they've discovered it's cheaper, it's more efficient, it's more reliable um, than some totalitarian model where you have to rely on uh, uh, an individual who uh, you know, could pursue their own interests um, uh, against the interests of, uh, of the ruling class. And of course, the illusion of, uh, of, of control, the illusion of, uh, of, of democracy helps to keep uh, the masses in check, helps to give them uh, an illusion that they have a say over how their lives are run. But should democracy ever produce an outcome uh, that genuinely threatens the interests of the ruling class, they have absolutely no qualms uh, in doing away with this. And we've seen this many times uh, throughout history. You know, we've seen it in coups uh, throughout Latin America uh, and the Middle East, usually instituted at the behest of, uh, of American uh, and British um, imperialism. Uh, but we should have absolutely no illusions in the British ruling class. Um, if it came down to it, if they were threatened uh, with the socialist revolution in this country, they would willingly establish a military dictatorship to prevent that revolution. And the monarchy would be absolutely central uh, uh, to this by using its reserve powers to uphold the constitution. For example, what would have happened if Corbyn had been uh, elected? Do you remember there were, there were threats uh, from a number of uh, shadowy army generals who said if Corbyn was elected, uh, the army would step in and carry out a coup. And these were you know, widely reported uh, in, in newspaper presses. And it's not difficult to imagine a scenario, you know, had, had Corbyn been elected, if he'd refused to back down uh, to the demands of the bourgeoisie, who inevitably would have stepped in to try and prevent Corbyn from carrying out uh, his programme, it's not difficult to imagine a scenario where they manufacture a national crisis, you know, through a strike of capital or, 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 or some other means, and invite the Queen to step in uh, and save the country. Now, some people might think that such a scenario uh, is far-fetched, you know, a bit of, uh, uh, you know, what happened if Corbyn had won the 27 election fan fiction. Uh, surely such a thing couldn't actually happen uh, in, in, a, in a wonderful democratic country uh, like Britain. In Britain, where a coup has been seriously discussed, uh, um, uh, 
by the representatives of, of big business uh, and the military in the last 50 years, and that's in 1968, 1974, uh, and 1979. Coincidentally, all years in which a Labour government uh, was in power. Well, obviously not so much uh, a coincidence. So the most famous of these is in 1968, where there were plans to launch a coup uh, in Britain uh, in which a military regime under Lord Mountbatten uh, would be established. So Lord Mountbatten was part of uh, the royal family. He was the uncle of, uh, of everyone's uh, uh, favourite racist, uh, Prince Philip. Um, he was the chief of defence staff uh, until 1965, when his opposition to Wilson's Labour government uh, uh, led to his retirement. Now at this time, very similar to Australia in the 70s, uh, Britain was facing a serious economic crisis. There was industrial uh, unrest, there was the devaluation of uh, the pound, there was a great dissatisfaction uh, in the ruling class. You could feel the decline of British capitalism, they could feel their, their influence slipping away on a world scale. Uh, even the head of uh, the CIA's counterintelligence unit had told MA5 that uh, Wilson uh, was a secret uh, Soviet agent. And it's, it's a fact of history. Uh, you know, you can read it in the memoirs of people who were involved uh, at the time. It's not uh, 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 an invention. It's a fact of history that a real coup uh, plan was hatched uh, at this time to overthrow um, uh, the Wilson government. It involved uh, Cecil King, who was the chairman of the Mirror Group, who, who writes very candidly about this in his, his uh, autobiography and uh, the director of the Bank of England, alongside uh, Lord Mountbatten. And the only reason that the coup failed at the time was because the Queen was not prepared to use her reserve powers. They felt that the time wasn't right. The balance of forces uh, in society would have led to a massive backlash, which would have undermined the monarchy and discredited any future role. Um, that's because these powers really have to be held back as a, as a, as a means of last resort. And as Bacolt wrote uh, describing these powers, he said, the secret prerogative, that being the prerogative to, to, to dismiss democratically elected governments, is an anomaly, perhaps the greatest of anomalies. That secrecy, however, is essential to the utility of English royalty as it now is. Above all things, our royalty is to be reverenced, and if you begin to poke about of it, you cannot reverence it. You must not let daylight in upon the magic. We must not bring the Queen into the combat of politics, or she will cease to be reverenced by all combatants. She will become one combatant, combatant amongst uh, many. Um, what Bakewell is saying here is that, you know, the, well, he's saying two things. One, that uh, the Queen's powers can only be used as a means of absolute last resort. And until this time, they have to be shrouded in mystery. They have to be kept hidden uh, from the view of public. And he's also saying that if these powers are used, it's essential that the monarchy commands the respect of the majority of the population. Uh, that's why the ruling class puts so much effort into building up uh, 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 the monarchy by, you know, spinning this web of lies and these myths of, uh, of, of, of how wonderful uh, the Queen is, how wonderful the monarchy is, how we should all uh, respect her and appreciate the hard work um, that she does uh, for the nation. And it's why the ruling class are in fact so concerned about the scandals that have rocked uh, the royal family in recent years. Because the open conflicts, uh, the splits and the brawls we've seen within the royal family openly paraded across the pages of the tabloid press um, have served to seriously undermine uh, uh, the monarchy. For, the, for example, the revelations of, uh, of Harry and Meghan are not just tittle-tattle, they have a serious impact. You know, you may wonder why, uh, why, why Marxists were uh, you know, interested in the, in the revelations of uh, you know, these super wealthy and privileged uh, individuals you know, talking about how hard their lives are on, uh, on uh, Oprah Winfrey's um, show. But actually, you know, they, they do play an important role in society, um, you know, lifting the lid on what goes on uh, uh, behind the scenes, showing the reality uh, of, of the royal family. 
And of course, I'm sure as you all know, one of the most disgusting revolution, revelations uh, included the claim uh, by Meghan that one royal, um, who we don't know who it is, uh, but I think we can probably all guess, uh, had expressed to Harry concerns and conversations about how dark their skin, uh, their son's skin might be uh, when he was born. Um, you know, for the crime of having a child uh, that was mixed race, the royal family took their revenge uh, uh, by denying him uh, the title of prince and the concomitant prince uh, police protection. Uh, and Meghan claimed her general treatment at the time was, uh, was such that it pushed her to the point of feeling suicidal. And the picture the couple uh, presented uh, of the family was one of a mean, duplicitous, racist and vengeful clique. Um, at the head of a feudal relic that was unwilling and unable uh, to reform itself. And who could have faith in such a, a, a rotten institution? But unfortunately for the royals, unfortunately for the ruling class, the scandals uh, keep coming. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, as uh, Georgina mentioned, it was revealed that the Metropolitan Police would take no action over the allegations uh, against uh, Prince Andrew. It's obvious that it's one rule uh, for them uh, and one rule for the rest of us. The court case against him, however, in, in the States is, uh, is pressing on, with Andrew now having to accept that he's been uh, served papers by a US court official. Apparently, this followed multiple attempts to avoid being served, apparently just turning up at royal palaces, uh, <laughs> you know, knocking on the doors. Is Prince Andrew there? I'd like to uh, serve him a papers accusing him of, uh, of being a rapist and a paedophile. No, sorry, Prince Andrew isn't in today. He can't, he can't accept that ac accusation. Uh, but eventually, somehow, they did, uh, did uh, serve the papers on him. Um, and the Queen is actually allegedly paying millions from her private funds to pay Prince Andrew's legal fees. How disgusting is that? The Queen, who is kept in these palaces at taxpayers' expense, is using millions of pounds to defend her son uh, uh, from facing the court allegations uh, of raping a young woman. It's absolutely uh, uh, disgusting and criminal. Of course, her funds are probably uh, ultimately leached off the pu public purse in any case. And press reports also say that Prince William, uh, who's obviously next in heir to the throne after Prince Charles, now considers Prince Andrew to be a danger to the monarchy. Uh, you know, they want to keep him hidden from public and apparently they've had a, they've had a big meeting and they're like, Prince Andrew, we're just going to lock him in a cupboard somewhere and pretend he doesn't exist. And I think this gets to the heart of uh, what's, what's this all about. You know, they have no interest uh, in justice. They have no interest in, 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 in uh, finding out the truth. Truth. They want to uh, uh, keep the scandals hidden away under lock and key uh, in order to protect the monarchy. Uh, but how long is it till the truth um, comes out? So the monarchy have always been a gang of corrupt uh, parasites. But the difference is that now all their scandals and degeneracy, uh, well, probably not all of them, you know, I'm sure there's, there's, there's many more disgusting things that we don't know about yet, uh, are on display uh, for people uh, to see. And any genuine working class party, uh, any genuine organisation that, that, that represented the interests of, of working people in this country would stand for their wholesale overthrow. Instead, Sir Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, lavishes praise uh, on the Queen. And apparently, the royal family, according to him, is a beacon of hope uh, for millions. I feel very hopeful. But in contrast to this obsequiousness, to this cowardly position of the Labour leaders, we must be absolutely crystal clear and unapologetic in our view of the monarchy. We demand its total and complete abolition. We want to open up their palaces, expose their sordid deeds to the public uh, for all to see. And we would nationalise their obscene wealth and put it to use in solving the problems of society. And that wealth really is uh, obscene. The Sunday Times estimated the Queen has a personal net worth of 330 million. But the royal family collectively, as an institution, is worth an estimated $88 billion uh, by Forbes. How many hungry children could we feed uh, with that money? How many homeless people uh, could we house? How many hospitals uh, could we build? 
Yet despite this enormous wealth, uh, the estimated total annual cost of the monarchy uh, to the public purse is 334 million, um, around eight times the, the official figure that the, the royal family uh, uh, published. This is the money that we pay, that working people pay through their taxes for the privilege of the ruling class maintaining a reserve weapon to use against us uh, should we ever dare to rise up and seriously threaten uh, their interests. So it's clear, you know, anybody who actually, uh, you know, consistently believes uh, in, in democracy, anyone who believes in a, in, a, in a truly democratic state should also believe in the overthrow, uh, the abolition of the monarchy, the abolition of, uh, uh, of the House of Lords. Of course, we don't just believe in that. We stand for the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism. And that has to include the monarchy and all its other rotten institutions. But in our work um, uh, uh, in the labour movement, in our work of building forces of, of Marxism, we need to be absolutely clear of the real role that the monarchy plays. It is a weapon in the hands of the ruling class uh, that will be used against uh, uh, the labour movement, that will be used against the, uh, uh, the workers of Britain um, uh, as we struggle uh, for our own interests. And we need to disarm the ruling class of its weapons. We need to smash those weapons in the process of, of taking power uh, in, into our own hands, of overthrowing capitalism, setting about the genuine transformation of society for completing the task that the bourgeoisie themselves started uh, in the English Civil War, uh, uh, the task that was carried to its end uh, uh, by Cromwell in beheading the king, uh, the task of overthrowing the monarchy and setting about the trans socialist transformation of Britain uh, and the world.